the items we're going to cover are firstly the obligations so that we know under the standards when you work for a registered training organization what the actual requirements for professional development are so you can tick those boxes because that's important but then we'll also get into why is it actually a good idea even if you didn't have to do it what would be some good reasons for doing pd and some good benefits of it um, what professional development should i do uh, some ideas that we can bounce around and i'll get your your input on this next section which is about strategies some different ideas and we've got quite a lot of things to share with you on different strategies for engaging in professional development we're looking at the power of reflection more importantly active reflection and then we'll finish off with some strategies for how you can plan your pd if that's useful so lots of opportunities for involvement today which is good and you know you don't have to wait for my invitation we've got the chat there so um th there are a lot of participants today but I'll, i will try and um, keep an eye on that so if you have any questions along the way please pop them into the chat so that i can uh, bring it up and have a bit of a, a discussion about that so let's get into it the obligation so here's the standards for rto so if you if you probably are aware that when you are a teacher or a trainer and assessor that works in a registered training organization that includes TAFE or many of the hundreds and hundreds of private providers in Australia there are some requirements in those standards that state that you have to do PD so whether or not you want to you kind of have to do it if you're going to be a trainer and assessor they kind of double up in the standards a little bit so there's there's two main clauses that cover the requirements for professional development and uh i'll just address that thanks for the question wayne will we be sharing the powerpoint absolutely so we always put the powerpoint up along with the summary and links to all the resources and everything else so um, you definitely won't miss out we'll put a recording up as well so any of your colleagues who couldn't make it can uh, watch watch the session back again and so yeah there's two parts in the standards for rtos that require professional development in a way they kind of restate each other a little bit i will flag too that the standards for rtos are currently under review so we may see a revised version come out in the next maybe a few years i don't know it could be sooner um usually these things are pretty slow moving so the first part of pd obligations in the standard is that the rto's training and i'm summarizing here too the rto's training and assessment is delivered only only by persons who have and i've just cut out a bit at the top but just just to keep it simple if you want more information go to that link down the bottom askwood.gov.au forward slash standards and look up the clause but the key parts are part B and C. So part B says current industry skills directly relevant to the training and assessment being provided. And then C, which is current knowledge and skills in vocational training and learning that informs their training and assessment. So that's, that's two areas. So it means you've got to keep your professional development and stay current in the industry that you teach. So if you're teaching hairdressing, you need to be up to date with all the latest stuff that's going on in that industry. Teaching um, engineering and fabrication, then you need to be up to date with the latest things that are going on in the, the engineering and fabrication industry. So that's the stuff that you're teaching. And that's B. And then C is current knowledge and skills in, in VET. So it's basically techniques for teaching and learning, um, anything that helps you become a better teacher, a better trainer, anything that helps you become a better assessor and boosts the quality there so there's that two-pronged area 1.16 really just adds to that that second point it says that the rto must ensure that their trainers and assessors undertake professional development in the fields of the knowledge and practice of vocational training learning and assessment including competency-based training and assessment so doing the, these kind of sessions that we run every month or so are really good for that it helps you tick the box of 
1.13c and tick the box of 1.16. So I'm really pleased that we can help you with that one. Um, so that's that's the kind of you have to stuff. That's about it. And uh, when you get the, the copy of the slides, I've actually included the direct link to ASQA's page. So you can kind of dig into that because they include a user guide as well, which goes into a lot more information and gives some examples of how you might meet those obligations. So it's good to do PD because you, you're ticking the box. You have to do it. And your RTO CEO or director or compliance manager will be very happy with you <laughs> because you're helping them meet their obligations uh, to ASCO or to the other any other regulator and meet their obligations under the standards. So much of what we're talking about today hinges on this requirement, but also I think it's really good when we're looking at this stuff to kind of go, where, where do I really, what do I feel about this? It's, it's much better if we do something because we actually want to and we see a benefit in doing it rather than just because we have to because you know, the standards say we have to. So I put that question over to you of why engage in PD? Well, we, yeah, we know we have to. If we want to be trained as an assessor's vet, yes, we have to do professional development. But I'd love to hear from you. What are some good reasons or good benefits of engaging in professional development? And when you and put this in the chat section, um, when you put your thoughts and responses in there. Don't just think about it for yourself, but think about the flow on effects. Because if, if every, imagine the, you know, the role that the trainer and assessor plays in bed, you're affecting the lives of thousands of um, Australians who are building their careers and building their knowledge. So, so your professional development flows on to your students. And then it flows on from them in their practice, in their practice because they've been so well trained by you uh, that they're more productive and happy workers. And it, it, you can see the flow on effect. Many of those things are immeasurable. But anyway, let's let's hear from you. What are some good reasons to engage in PD? All right, a lot of stuff flowing through here, so I'll I'll do my best to to capture the the good moments. Um, all right, so Daniel, I've got your question there. Who is responsible for ensuring these obligations are met? Uh, in an RTO, that will vary. Typically, it's there's a, a role such as a compliance manager. Um, ultimately, it falls on the, the, the chief executive of the training provider of the RTO to, to ensure that all these things are put in place, but they'll probably have processes and procedures for that. So good question, Daniel. Um, but uh, and, and ultimately, they're answerable to the regulator. In most cases, it's ASQA, the Australian Skills Quality Authority, who will regulate and monitor RTOs to make sure they're doing that. So um, later on, we'll look at some strategies for record keeping, and you'll see that why it's really good to keep good records so that you can actually prove that these things are being done. All right. So coming back to your thoughts on why engage in PD. So some really good comments here, really awesome stuff here to remain current and up to date. You can learn techniques from your peers. Um, Kylie, you've asked, what are the rules around returning to industry? I think you're referring to, okay, you've become a trainer and assessor and now you uh, maybe you're full time and suddenly a few years go by and you haven't really worked in industry. How do you keep your skills current? Um, the rules are pretty much what I had on the previous screen is that you just need to maintain currency in your industry and how you go about that. There's no specific guidelines. Um, some RTOs require their trainers and assessors on a, on a periodic basis to go out uh, maybe a couple of times per year to go and do a week or a day or whatever of working in industry. I think that's what you meant. Let me know if I was off track there. Uh, we've got some other thoughts here, learning, learning more about the industry, sharing with your students uh, for providing effective training, keeping up to date with industry standards, upgrading skills, keeping up to date with trends, lots on keeping up to date, which is awesome, maintaining currency, improving teaching, good strategies to enhance your profession, Craig says to stay current, learning with like-minded people, helping learners get uh, the most relevant up-to-date experience. Hi, Molly. 
Great comment there, best practice, current industry trends, uh, best training and assessment techniques for specific student learners, that's good. It can lead to better engagement with learners, Michael, that's a great comment. Um, more on currency, um, updating yourself with compliance to be more reliable and knowledgeable, that's good. Learning new ideas. It's energy. I love that comment, Craig. Uh, PD is energizing. I find that too. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, you can get a little bit stuck in a rut with things and then these fresh ideas flow in. And sometimes they come from really surprising places. Like we seek professional development in our industry, of course. You know, we go to conference, vet conferences or industry conferences or whatever. But sometimes the inspiration and energy can come from other places too. Jeremy's pointed out, if we don't do regular updates, we're going to become complacent. So we must keep up to date to accept our responsibilities as professionals. Yeah, it's about being professional, isn't it? Really awesome comments. I, I, I couldn't possibly get through all of these really awesome ideas. Um, so I, I would encourage you to have a look through this chat transcript because all of you are sharing far better ideas than I could possibly have come up with myself. Um, and a couple of questions have popped up there. Let me address those. Is PD enough to be current or do you have to work in industry? Um, the standards do not clarify that. So coming from the, the must perspective, uh, the standards don't dictate whether you must go and work in industry. I think good practice would say that you have real experience and probably the only way to get good real experiences is, is through real work. Um, we often hear stories of, you know, just if I look out my window here, I'm looking directly into the trades centre at um, the North Coast Institute of TAFE, the state-of-the-art facility, it's awesome. Um, but, you know, sometimes you, you hear stories of where, you know, the apprentice uh, does their couple of days a week at TAFE and then they go off and they, they go, go on to the job and they, suddenly they see a new piece of equipment or a tool or a technique on the job and they think, oh, we didn't learn about this at, at our RTO. Um, or the, the, the teacher taught me how to do it this way and the, the person on the job says, no, we haven't done that for 20 years. So... However, we can try and move away from that situation happening, the better. And, and, and my apologies to Amanda and Kylie and anyone. I know, I know sometimes we, we're, we're trying to pursue these concrete. Would, would someone please just tell me how many days of year do I have to send my trainers out into industry? And do they have to actually work or can they just go for a bit of a tour of the facility? And there's no concrete answers. Uh, but I think any, anything we can do that steps us in the right direction to enhancing our practice, becoming more current, the better it is. I like this comment from Crystal here. The students will teach, uh, the, sorry, the students we teach will enjoy their training more and also come away with a better impression of learning. Really good stuff here. Yes, why won't I'll leave that. You can have a, have a read through those comments. Really good stuff there. Uh, now, I'm just going to check also, there's a few things that have come through in the, the Q&A section. Great. Thanks for your contribution, Madonna. Yep. Fantastic. Gain confidence. Transfer knowledge and skills. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much for contributing that. Really good ideas. Fantastic stuff. So I think we all know why it's a good idea to get into PD. And it's not just about ticking the box, but also about actually becoming the best trainers that we can be. I mean, why not do that? There, there are plenty of other career choices that we can make. We don't have to be educators. There's probably ways that you can make more money if that's if, if money is the only reason you do it so if we're here because we have some bigger purpose about you know why we want to be educators and why we want to teach people in training providers um, I think we can kind of tap into that that bigger reason for professional de development 
So another question that comes up is, uh, how do I know what PD I need to do? Because, you know, you wouldn't be in your job if you weren't already pretty damn good at it. You know, you've got your cert for in training and assessment, maybe even a diploma of a vet or something like that. You might even have further qualifications in adult education. You might have been in your industry for 20 or more years. So it's very easy to go, well, I'm, I'm pretty rock solid in, in where I am. Where would I want to go from here? It's interesting. I, I feel like sometimes uh, I've been at my worst professionally uh, when I've actually felt like I didn't really need any PD. I felt oh, I'm pretty good. You know, I'm, I'm cruising along. I know my stuff. And, uh, and it's only on reflection and in hindsight and look back and go, gee, I, I really didn't know much. That, was a, that wasn't the best mindset to have. And that, you know, the last point I've got on the slide there, uh, I don't know what I don't know. So there's so much that we only know just such a tiny fraction of what's possible out there. And so it's only by getting involved in different things that we can expand our understanding and explore more ideas of what's possible. What are the opportunities out there? So back to that question of where am I? So taking stock of our current skills and knowledge and ability, but also where am I going? What do I need to do for my PD? What do I prioritize? Because there's so many opportunities available. You know, we've got sessions like ours that we run on a, fa on a fairly regular basis. So that those alone can keep you busy and keep you ticking all the boxes. So sometimes you might get into the habit of going, well, what, what's the priority? Because we've got a finite amount of time. What's going to give me the most bang for my buck? Uh, if I spend, you know, 20% of my time on this thing, what's going to give me you know, 80% of the results, the old 80-20 rule. So again, just harking back to the pre, the pre where we talked about what we have to do. So we've got the industry currency, the stuff that you actually teach, and then we've got our teaching currency. So how good we are as trainers and assessors. So the first point there, reviewing competency and other standards, including job description. So that, that can shed some light into where you stand in relation to what you're teaching. So for most of us in RTOs, we, we do teach to units of competency. Now, competencies are basically a, a written standard that have been agreed to by industry that clearly specify what someone would do in that job role. So they're a really good source of information and you can actually review the unit and look at all the performance criteria and the knowledge evidence and just see where you stand in that. Maybe there'll be a few things that jump out and go, ah, maybe I could explore that a little bit further. So that might highlight some areas for, for professional development. There might be other industry standards that you could look at for your industry. Maybe even going back to your job description, your training provider's job description. Seeking feedback from students and peers is a really great way to understand where you might want to develop. Sometimes it's difficult for us to see for ourselves where that development is needed. And sometimes being, you know, if we're really open to feedback, students and colleagues and peers and managers and whoever else, uh, getting really honest feedback from them can highlight areas for improvement. I think with anything like that, you know, a lot of us collect feedback from students to see how we're going. Um, it's, it's very easy to get caught up on just one comment, you know, that a student might make that might be very particular to the context of that day, you know, how you were delivering, or how you felt or how they felt, what was going on for them. So when you're looking at feedback from students, try and look for the patterns. You know, if, if a few things start to crop up every, every time you run a session, it's the same comments over and over again, maybe it's time to look at what that might mean, what's underneath that and explore that further. Later on, I'll talk about active reflection and that can reveal things like pain points. And what I mean by that is you might, if you reflect on the training that you do, Every time you go and run that session, there might be something, there might be just a part of the session that maybe drags a little bit every time you do it, that you, you know, there's parts that you really look forward to delivering, parts of the lesson plan that are fun and gets everyone going, but then there's parts where you kind of, oh, gee, I'm not looking forward to that. Why is that? How could I improve that part of the session? Or what is it about my delivery or the way I assess that could be improved and make that perhaps a little bit more joyful? 
And another thing too, this, I don't, who, who has come across the Vet Practitioner Capability Framework from IBSA? There was an interesting thing that was developed uh, well over 10 years ago now. So it was when IBSA was the Industry Skills Council and they were responsible for developing a few different training packages and, in, and uh, including the TAE package. So it was when they brought out the TAE 10, TAE 40110, and they were doing, doing all the development there, it came to light that it would be really good for VET to have a practitioner capability framework, kind of like a set of standards that described excellence for vocational education professionals. And that framework, they, they, the government funded it and they developed it. And we, I'll, I'll give you a link to that shortly. Uh, but that's, that's still around. Like the IBSA don't host it anymore, but they released it under a Creative Commons license. So we can distribute that for you. So I'll put a link to that in the chat in just a moment. But that might be a really good source of information too, to see where you might stand against what was agreed at least, you know, probably, what, 12 years ago now. Um, was a framework of excellence for trainers and assessors. Uh, and <laughs> Angela, you said you came across the VET capability framework last year, eight years as a trainer. Yeah, look, it, it was a little bit sad, really, because it kind of faded into insignificance. And I was talking to a, a colleague from another provider who's a, a researcher in a university, and uh, they were contracted by a government agency to do some further research into vet capability frameworks. And so it's kind of like, we already have a really good, something that's really good that's already been developed. So a little bit of a bit of a shame that that kind of fell by the wayside. Um, but just give me a moment. I'm just going to pop that into the chat. Um, we've got here the capability framework. And... So there's a link to that in the chat. Now I'm just gonna catch up. I, I know there's been a lot of chitter chatter going on here and I'll just take a moment to review that. I'm on my own today, so I'm kind of doing the moderation in the, the presenting. Um, I love that comment from Gregory. I learn something new every day, especially from my students. I fully agree with that. Really cool. Um, there's a question from Falguni. Hi, Paul, how to know that the industry how to know that the industry PD1 does is compliant in meeting the requirements. That's really interesting. And I'm seeing a lot of this. It's kind of, and this is very common in the standards, I think, where you know the standards dictate this fairly broad statement that can be interpreted in a few different ways. So we have this desire to um, be prescribed some more information. Like, what do you want? <laughs> what do you want from me? And uh, so I, I don't know how to answer your question more specifically, but I think a really good solution to that, and this is what I've found because, you know, we, we run an RTO here to Falguni and it's the same kind of thing. You know, we're often grappling with these questions. How much, how much PD should we do? What PD? How, you know, do we have to go out there and do it real, real work experience? Um, how do we know what we're doing is compliant and meeting the requirements? So one of the ways that we do that is, is through networking. We talk to a lot of other providers. What are you doing? What worked for you? Hey, you got audited recently. Um, what did they say about your PD? So talking and chatting with other providers and hey, right now you've got uh, quite a lot of other representatives from RTOs here in the session. So it's a maybe good networking opportunity. Jump on LinkedIn. There's lots of really great um, networks of practitioners and professionals from RTO land who would be probably willing to share ideas. And I think together, when you kind of form that understanding, you can feel like you, you're being a bit more assured. Be careful with that sort of thing, though, because sometimes, you know, depending on the company that you keep, it's very easy to descend into a, a realm of um, maybe not such good practice and assuring each other that, you know, the, the bare minimum is okay. So I, I like to, to hang out with really good providers that I, that I respect, the, maybe that have raised the bar a little bit and kind of make us work a bit harder. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, okay, so Dr. Peter Rivers has suggested that currently he does uh, over 60 hours a year in PD. That's very, very fantastic. That's, that's admirable. 
Um, Michael has said, I work for TAFE and unless I get a statement of attendance, the PD is rejected. That's really interesting. Um, fortunately, not all TAFEs work like that, but sometimes you do find different departments have their own policies or ways of doing things. Um, and that can be, uh, you know, that can change the way PD is done. Uh, I know a few people have raised their hands. I'm sorry if I've missed anyone. There's very, I'm really loving the interactivity today. It's such a fantastic session. Um, just let me check here. So, Samantha, if you want to pop in the chat and Bradley, your question, I know you've raised your hand. It just might be a bit easier if you pop it in there for me to address your question. So I'll keep an eye out for that. Thanks for putting your hand up. Um, and I'll just check the, uh, the Q&A as well. Okay, Angela said, are there any plans to develop an industry-wide PD record keeping or matrix document? Seems I have to rejig these with every employer. Not that I'm aware of. I know there is some active research into some strategies for possibly prescribing things. But I think, you know, what happens is in all this uh, desire for, you know, tell me what to do, tell me what to do, as soon as the, the government or whoever tells us what to do, we say, hey, don't tell us what to do. We, we do it this way and it works really well. So you kind of get these two opposing forces. Okay, what happens if you're not teaching and only assessing? Uh, the standards, the wording of the standards talk about both teaching and assessing. So I suppose if you're really assured that you're only only focusing on assessing, then it would be okay for your PD to be mostly in the world of assessing. So that's about, that's my thoughts on that, Graham. I'm not sure, perhaps check with your compliance manager as well. Um, I think we've covered that one, Falguni. Sorry if I haven't covered it in, in enough detail. Uh, Jeff, you've said, I keep hearing that industry depicts how training packages are written. Uh, who is industry? That's a great question. Uh, it's, it's a slightly complicated picture and there could even be a, a whole session on that. Uh, and of course, it has recently changed. So I'll just keep it general, um, but basically there are what were called industry reference committees. I don't know if they've changed or what the new terminology is around them, but basically there'd be committee, committee of members, maybe 10 to 20 people, something like that. I'm only going off my experience with the education industry reference committee who are representative of industry and they usually form diverse opinions. So there might be, uh, you know, some, some members from, you know, competing industry players from big and small, from private and public, and they all get together and they kind of form the conduit of advice and they advise what were previously the skills service organizations, and they would be the ones that had the consultants that did all the hard, the, you know, the, the typing and the developing of the actual competency standards. But they would actually get their information from industry reference committees and working groups and everything else. So they, they're pretty well, I mean, I, having seen some of these industry reference committees work in the past, I really do feel confident that they're quite well represented with quite, quite well represented with really diverse members. And um, the, the, the skill service organizations, at least the ones I've participated with in the past, have been really receptive to change um, and, and really do take on feedback. And, my, and I really don't envy their job because they're collating a lot of information from very diverse opinions, very hard to, to please everybody. Uh, Greg, you've said industry-specific PD cover the units of competency and the qualification you're teaching. I do approximately 50 hours per year. That's awesome, Greg. Love your work. That's fantastic. Thanks for your contributions so far. Okay, I'm hearing about these, uh, you know, the, Michael suggested TAFE has a well-structured point system, um, 100 points minimum PD required, um, 40. So look, that, that's so good. When, when your provider has gone to answer 
the um, answer the call of the, the standards and requirements with their own kind of robust system. I think that's really good. It keeps everyone um, moving in the right direction. So really great to hear that. Um, a, a comment from you, Samantha. Are there any resources ASQA prefers for PD opportunities for certain industries? Uh, no. I, I think, you know, again, ASQA is just made up of human beings and, you know, there might sometimes you, you might hear of certain auditors perhaps having different opinions on things. But ultimately, I think it's about moving towards excellence. I... You know, there's some really big providers of, of formal professional development in VET, and I know they've been really well accepted in, uh, you know, during audits and performance assessments. I think I think any reasonable auditor or or assessor from the regulator would accept, you know, a really genuine attempt and a systematic attempt at, at PD. And I've seen. RTOs that have gotten through an audit where their you know, their professional development may have been a little bit lacking, you know, not there was no system around it. There's just kind of a they they'd show them a few certificates and things of PD they've done in the last twelve months and a couple of examples and and it's all been a little bit haphazard and they've kind of gone, eh, you know, maybe it could be improved, but you you do tick the box. So I think they're pretty flexible on it. The more robust and the more professional you know, is professional development. So the more professional you can make it, and the more systematic, I think, the better. Again, it comes back to maybe the deeper reasons as to why we do it, not just to tick the boxes. Now, I would put forward that strategies can be formal and informal. So formal meaning, you know, any an actual formal course that you do, something that probably gives you a certificate at the end or some kind of acknowledgement. And also there are informal strategies, things that perhaps you don't get a certificate for and are probably more self-directed. And in my experience, and I've definitely been through audits in the past where this process has been accepted, I really think some of the more profound professional development experiences I've had have been what might be termed informal, uh, but I've formalized them through application and through record keeping. So I'll share with you a strategy for that so that you can try and make those informal professional development opportunities. It probably happened naturally anyway. So you might be recommended a really good book on you know, the science of learning or something like that. And it's really new research. And there's probably not many other ways that you would be able to gain that latest research and, and an, an understanding of that and the ability to apply that without actually reading the book. There's not going to be any courses on that because it's all new research. And so you go and you read that book and it really sparks your imagination and gets you feeling really refreshed and excited. And you try some of these things in the classroom and they work really well. I mean, that, that's, a re, that, that's a moment where you have developed professionally. You've had a really profound and powerful moment of professional development. And yet, you know, if you, if you are sitting at an audit and you need to prove that you've done PD and you say, oh, well, I read a book, uh, that, that probably won't cut it. So I'm going to suggest you provide you with an, a, a way that you can actually try and capture and make those less formal opportunities, perhaps a little more formal, so they might count. Now, of course, Michael and a few others have mentioned that perhaps their provider would reject such things. And that's, I mean, you, you've always got to fall in line with whatever your provider's policies are. But uh, I know many places would be uh, very comfortable with this kind of thing, as long as it's coupled with genuine formal strategies for professional development as well. So from, I'd like to hear from you now. Uh, I know there's been lots of really awesome discussions so far, but I'd love to hear from you on what formal strategies you could take in professional development. So there are things like, you know, something like this, where you get a certificate, I'm going to a conference, doing a course. So what are your suggestions of formal PD strategies that you can share with the group for the benefit of everybody else?
Okay, Elizabeth said, I've recently gone back into training role and was amazed how much muscle memory I had on one of the courses I was training and assessing on. It was a course that I'd taught for 20 plus years, doing PD in those years, even though it wasn't training the course, helped me big time in retaining that muscle memory. Cool, love it. Uh, Lynn says, why do some RTOs who deliver online courses fail to fully recognize and support third-party validation of resources as part of PD? I don't know. I, I really don't know that why they would fail to recognize that. Um, so third-party validation of resources as part of PD. Yeah. I don't know. I think there's a lot of context there, Lynn, that, that might um, be missing from the conversation. Mm, I'll come across that. Daniel said, speaking for five instructors, our employer has said PD is our responsibility and we are to do it in our own time at our own expense, which I believe conflicts with ASCA guidance and is unreasonable given that we all deliver an average of 35 hours of face-to-face -face instruction each week. Is there any recourse we have for dealing with this? I don't know. <laughs> so I've had a lot of I don't know moments. I'm sorry. They're very contextual. Um, I know for us, I really do support PD. You know, we fund it. We put a lot of time into it for our trainers. It's, it is very important. I just, I think that's just an opportunity for me to really emphasize that, you know, the, the standards do make it clear that the RTO must ensure. But, um, you know, part of professional development is uh, part of being a professional is maintaining your own professional development. So I, I guess, you know, maybe it's a contractual requirement in the job that's written into it. I don't know. I'm really sorry. Uh, anyway, back to the discussion. Great points, though. Uh, the, the formal strategies are online learning, uh, going to an expo, courses and webinars, conference, masterclass website, doing a webinar, industry organized PD days. Um, uh, Molly has mentioned that during a performance assessment, they advised if a certificate or proof of attendance was not received, they'd expect a reflection activity to be done to demonstrate PD learning and engagement. Thank you for that, Molly. That's exactly the, um, the validation that I needed for something that I'll suggest to you in just a moment. I'm really glad you mentioned that. So that's really helpful to know. Uh, publications, mentoring and coaching, LinkedIn learning, subject matter PD, conferences, workshops, webinars, group training, shadowing classes of other teachers. That's awesome. Uh, workshops, short courses, uh, lots of webinars. That's really good. Attending industry-based conferences. Uh, Karen suggests visiting the TAC, the TAEC. That must be the Training Accreditation Council. Um, oh, you've mentioned that. It's the uh, w, Western Australian Specific Regulator. They have a great fact sheet on PD expectations and industry currency. Awesome. If you have a link for that, Karen, maybe pop it in the chat. I think you're, you're allowed to post links. That might be helpful. Um, professional mentoring. I regularly meet with other RTOs training in the same industry. Love that, Stephen. That's really good. Get involved on construction sites and ask questions and take notes. I think that's fantastic. Um, inductions. I induct all new trainers and assessors to our RTO, and I use this as a, a PD for continuous improvement. Very good. Mini courses. Um, a formal strategy can include casual employment in the industry and is a requirement for the units that I deliver. Yes, there may be um, specific obligations in your industry for PD. Jeremy says, as a civil construction trainer and assessor, I try to spend time with new equipment demonstration days and actually being taught the new ways of operating machinery and getting info booklets and PDF on the new equipment. Fantastic. I think your students would really appreciate that too. Alex says, belonging and being active in industry bodies, watching videos, uh, teaching as a lecturer in university, reading industry publications, and TAC have a number of good webinars in the first six months of 2023. That's great. Um, Setu has pasted a link to the Training Accreditation Council and WA's guidelines on PD. That's good. And, and so have you, Karen. Thank you for that. Um, and Megan says, you're very lucky. Uh, our RTO offer all staff one hour per week dedicated for PD. Kudos to your RTO. That is awesome. Love it. So I'm just going to put this, because uh, I think you've kind of addressed all these points, but just in case anything was missing, um, 
no surprises there. You were really on track with what I thought were formal strategies. And of course, some of these formal strategies kind of can merge into informal and some of the informal can become formal. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, now I've noticed Bradley, you've got a hand up and Lynn, you've got a hand up. Um, if you could pop it into the chat, your questions, please, or the q and I'm just gonna check the Q&A now. Jeff, your other question in the Q&A section is uh, basically how do they become a member of the committee? I think it's by nominations and applications. You need to do a Google search on industry reference committees and you'll find a, a website which lists all of the industry reference committees who, who are on these boards and what industries they represent. And you can raise that question with them. Really good points though. Um, yep, that's good. Are there any resources uh, providers? Ask, uh, so we've already talked about that one. Thank you, Samantha. Um, Sandy has set, asked, can you shed some light to professional and vocational development for teachers teaching TAE as their profession is teaching? So vocation is teaching too. Lillian has added to that. Thank you for, for jumping in there and kind of working together. I really love that as well. That's what this is all about. Um, strengthening the links and standards for competency for performance management, uh, measurement, sorry. So uh, that was that question about, you know, if you're a TAE trainer, how do you develop professionally? I think that there's a huge obligation on us as TAE practitioners to, uh, to really get out there and to, uh, I find the conferences like the, the VELG National Conference, they often share a lot of deeper insights and more advanced tactics for teaching and learning. Um, someone who makes a career of TAE might even consider higher education. So doing or doing research, um, research can be a really powerful way to uncover new ground in um, teaching and learning. There's plenty of more advanced practitioner networks out there that, that really address professional teaching as an art. Lots of really great research in the last few years. One, one that I quite like is He's more in the school sector, but a lot of it's, you know, it's based on, on real science, brain science, cognitive science of how people learn. Um, if you do a Google search for, just, just to save time, I'll just type it in now, education, Rick, Rick Shaw. It's kind of a funny name, but this is guy, um, his name escapes me right now. Uh, he's doing his PhD and he's got a lot of really great resources. He does, it will, a podcast and has lots of really good links to that kind of thing. So I think we really need to find opportunities that kind of put us at, at the cutting edge as TA trainers. Um, Greg has said, I have my own documents filled and signed by my industry provider to obtain industry currency. Certificates of attainment give me my TAE currency completed in my own time. TAFE allow time. Excellent. Great to hear, Greg. Uh, and Madonna has said, if I hear through my professional network of local and international RTOs, trainers and researchers about new training trends, I will make contact to find out about available training or readings. Fantastic. Love that. All right. Really great input so far. Thank you for that. Uh, now some informal strategies. So what I might do, I'm just conscious of time and, and covering things. So I'm just going to uh, jump into some informal strategies and rather than going through methodically each one, I'll point out some that I think are kind of interesting. So like I said, reading books, and that, that can be an audio book as well. Uh, so for anyone who's time poor, you know, listening to an audio book over a period of a month or so while you're on your commute or, you know, riding your bike or doing some exercise or something in otherwise unused time can be a really good way to enlighten yourself. But it like we said, there's no evidence that you did the PD and there's no way to kind of record that. And, and a lot of these informal strategies don't really have, you know, they don't come with a certificate. So I'll share with you something for that shortly. Um, watching TED Talks, YouTube videos, webinar recordings, they can be useful. Work experience and volunteering, watching other trainers shadowing, that's already been mentioned. Excursions, you know, so actually sending yourself on an industry visit can be really good. Newsletter descriptions. Um, 
And that last point there, uh, through pursuit of personal interest, sometimes it's through doing something totally unrelated that new ideas come to you and they can be really profound. I love networking as well, um, getting involved in professional networks. Really good. When, when you're involved in professional networks um, where you've got a lot of people in there who are you know, at the cutting edge, they really set the bar high and they will often share ideas or share things that they've done. And you, and you kind of think, oh, wow, they've just gone and done this course. They've put themselves through this course. Maybe that's something that I'd like to do. So it really opens up lots of ideas. Uh, so I mentioned a way of recording informal strategies. So just give me a moment. I'm going to put a link to some resources for you. Um, so we'll pop that open here. Um, and we'll come back to the screen. I'm just going to put this link in here. So I've just got two examples. So these are Google documents and We'll have a quick look at them. So just something that Molly mentioned in the chat, um, that they had a performance assessment recently from ASQA. And in this particular case, and you know, some, sometimes it may not be always this consistent, but the, uh, the auditor had said that non-formal PD opportunities may be okay, as long as there's some kind of reflection. Maybe you could elaborate on that if I've missed that, Molly, but basically something like this. So this is a little thing that, that I've put together that can be useful to capture and to formalize the informal. And I've got these two examples here. One's from, you know, if you've read a book and you want to turn it into a formal PD, and the other one's if you've watched a, a video, but you can basically use the same form. Feel free to take it and adapt it. Um, you don't need a Google account. You, all you need to do is just go up to the top and go to file and download. So a lot of these options will be grayed out if you're not signed into Google and you can download it as a Microsoft Word document or another format if you wish and adapt it. Steal it, do whatever you want with it. I really don't mind as long as it's useful. If you like anything that we share, if it is useful and you adapt it, I'd love to hear how you have been using it and how you've adapted it. Uh, but this can be really good. So basically it comes through and, and it's, you know, you kind of, you put the name at the top, the date and all that kind of stuff and what you actually did, but more importantly, the purpose. And so you can see in this example here, this is, this is fictitious, but just for the sake of illustration, um, the trainer said, I was feeling a little stale in some of my planning and delivery techniques. And I wanted to refresh some of my knowledge, learn some new ideas to see what could be applied in my teaching, in teaching my diploma of leadership management course. There's a little prompt there, you know, so what prompted the PD? Are you addressing a problem or just keeping up to date? And then there's an, another section here, objectives. So uh, it says here, uh, so, so basically set some really specific and measurable objectives. What do you want to achieve? What are you trying to get out of the PD rather than just doing it because it's interesting? And so here they set an objective where I, you know, I wanted to learn and apply at least five new teaching techniques based on scientific research of how people learn be more effective in my planning and refresh my enthusiasm for teaching by trying new techniques. And then this section here says outcomes. So what you plan to do or what you hope to achieve from it versus what actually happened. Uh, it turns out that in this case, they really only kind of adopted two new concepts, which they've applied directly. Um, they've mentioned them here and they've got a few more notes here. Yes, I feel more enthusiastic as a result. Um, and I also feel some greater confidence. And some final notes there. They've said, I'd love to share some of these concepts with some other trainers in an internal PD session run with my colleagues. So hopefully that's useful. In, and if it is and you adapt it, let me know. Um, but yeah, feel free to use that. Really happy for you to use and adapt however you wish. And reflection. So most of us reflect in, you know, maybe in a non-formal way, we run a session and we come out and we're just, uh, we're, we're glowing. Oh gosh, they loved it. Look at all these nice comments in my feedback form. Everyone thinks I'm a great trainer. I don't need any PD. Sometimes you have sessions that's just, wow, tough group. They ate me alive. You know, I quit. So that reflection, you know, is 
probably not the kind of reflection that we're really aiming for if we want to enhance our PD. So something like this can be more effective. And as the little picture there suggests, active reflection is really good when you actually write it down. Trainers and assessors that participate in an active reflection are usually far more uh, engaged in, in opportunities for professional development because they're really clear on what their needs are. So here's some prompting questions. You might think of other questions as well. What worked? Why did it work? Where could I improve? What could I do differently? Could the students use and apply what I taught them? How could I make this even better? What would happen if next time I dot, 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 tried this or tried that? Does this equip them, equip them for the job? Um, what actually happened versus, versus what my session plan said? So these kind of questions can really unlock some thinking. As long as you do some little journaling and writing, um, they can really unlock your thinking and finding opportunities for professional development, finding areas where you can improve. Strongly recommend that. It's a really good practice. And if you want another form of active reflection in terms of actual training performance, I'd recommend actually recording yourself. Get the phone or whatever in the corner of the room, press record, watch yourself in action. You probably cringe. We all do. It's very normal. But that can be really powerful, really useful in identifying those little refinements to your actual presentation and teaching skills. And now the final part of uh, our session today is the planning and recording thing. So really, I think any type of PD that actually develops you and enhances your performance in some way is a great PD opportunity. The most important thing is that you actually record that and get it down on paper so that you, know, you can demonstrate it and prove it. So overall, I think the steps are pretty simple. Number one, make a plan. Number two, do the PD. And number three, keep a record. That's probably enough. But if you're really keen on developing, add a fourth step in there, review it. How did it go? Did it work? Did it actually benefit me? And then go back to the start. Review your plan, do the PD, keep a record and review. Simple step process to keeping yourself uh, on track for professional development. So on the topic of planning, uh, as I suggested to you, I've got a, another little freebie for you you can have. And again, feel free to, to use it. Um, just grab that. Just give me a moment. And I'll pop it in the chat. This is our professional development plan and record template. So that's, that's now in the chat. And just like that other document I shared, you can just go to the file and download and you can download it as a, as a document. Or if you do use Google Docs, which is, which is quite a, a good system to use, um, that can be really helpful as well. You can just use those little, because I like these things here. Uh, and I've got some little examples in there to get you started. So you just got the name and year and all that kind of stuff at the top that you'd expect. A section to talk about your current strengths, a section to talk about your opportunities. And there's these little selection chips here, compliance area. You can drop down, you can choose industry currency, vet currency, and sometimes the two kind of combine. And you can actually just drop them down and change them. They're quite good. Um, you list your activity, the relevant courses and units that you teach. That's what, that's what you're teaching. Um, a link to some evidence or, or some other way of just noting that, that it actually happened, the date that it happened and the status. So whether it's planned, that's something you're going to do in future, something you're currently doing, or that it's been completed. And the reason that we, we set it out like this, it's just nice and simple, because uh, it means that you don't have to have a separate plan and then a separate record. It can just be all kept in the one place. So you can use that little status column of things that you're going to do. And then once it's been done, you just click the little switch and go, hey, I've completed it. So that can be really useful as well. So let's sum it up and wrap it up. I think I'm coming in just on time today. I was hoping for an early finish, but I think we got had some really fruitful discussions. And I want to really say that again, I, I, I really appreciate your contributions. It means a lot. And you're so, I know many of you, and uh, those of you I don't know, I can just tell from the comments that you're really keen on this kind of stuff. You're really big on developing yourself professionally. And what a great 
bunch of people to bring together for a session like this. So very honoured that you um, contributed like this. So uh, rather than kind of just summing up what we talked about, I, I will kind of pitch this more to uh, as, a, as a, a call to action for you. So I'd ask you the question of what areas do you want to develop yourself in over the next 12 months? What's your plan? Uh, take 15 minutes after this session to make a plan so you can steal our template and use that if you want. But probably check with your RTO because they might already have something in place. Uh, you probably already have a plan in place. So maybe just take 15 minutes to review it in light of anything, any insights you've had today. Maybe there's some new ideas you want to add to it. I love the idea of getting an accountability partner. So if you're active on LinkedIn or other professional networks, you know, maybe chat to a colleague, uh, even physically, and say, hey, you know, I'm planning these things for this year and I want to make sure I get them done. Um, what are you planning to do? Let's talk to each other and we'll check in on a monthly basis and kind of keep each other accountable. And sometimes just having that accountability partner can be really useful to keep you, keep you well, accountable, keep you on track. Start developing some habits for reflection. You know, we talked about that active reflection, um, networking, talking to people, sharing ideas, and uh, you know, really make 2023 your strongest year yet. And if you like our sessions, hey, we've got another session coming up next month and you're more than welcome to join and so are your colleagues as well. So anyone who you'd like to you know, bring along, uh, we'd really welcome them. We just, as long as it's someone who's keen on, you know, really serious on becoming better and um, and sharing their ideas with the group, then please do that. I will um, pop the link to book in for that in the chat as well, if you like it. So thank you so much for participating today. Now, unfortunately, there were a lot of things in the chat that I didn't get to. Uh, so I'm sorry if I didn't get to you, but I will stick around just for another couple of minutes. I'm just going to review that chat. And uh, if you felt like your question wasn't answered or you want to ask some more questions, I'm happy to stick around. Um, for the sake of the formal, uh, the formalities of today's session, I'm wrapping it up now. And I really thank you once again for your session. I'll include all of the things, uh, the, the, the links to the, the PowerPoints, the recordings, the links to the resources. And of course, as a thank you to spending your time with us, we'll send you a, a certificate, a PDF certificate, and you can give that to your your head teacher or your compliance manager for your, you know, for ticking those obligation boxes under the standards. So just give me a moment and I'll put the link in for our next session so you can book in for that if you're keen. The next session is on developing assessment checklists.